sharing screen. Hold on a second. Excellent. The recording is now in progress. Uh, this Excellent. is the awkward moment where I have to like start screen share and then start keynote. So everyone. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. While you're doing that, I, I can welcome you guys and welcome everyone. Um, so thank you for all the attendees who are with us now and who will be watching later. Um, my name is Nadine Shaheen. Um, I'm from I Love Typography. I'm super happy to be moderating the talk today. And I'm really, really happy to welcome the speakers on, on today's talk. So we have uh, Brian from Polymod and then Ben and Jesse, of course, from uh, XYT Type. And so, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this talk. I, I already love the animations I'm seeing. And yeah, I just leave it to you. Uh, for everyone in the audience, if you would like to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A. And hopefully we will, um, we will be taking uh, time for questions after. So uh, yeah, welcome to uh, to Ben. I will go mute and stop my video, and then you you enjoy. My God, this is a really an amazing. It's a bit hypnotic as well. Uh, give, but anyways, okay, enjoy and please go ahead. This is our strategy. Here we, we go. Weird, we've got a weird little artifact at the top of the screen. You want to try? We do. Yeah. Is try it... leaving full screen and then returning, maybe. Yeah, hold on. But then, like, while you're doing that, um, thanks, Masato. I did not, everyone, so you just so you know, I did not pay Masato to compliment me. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Is that good now? No, it's still there. I don't know what that is. We can is live with it. Super yep. bad, or okay. I don't see it. Um, okay. Should we go? Yeah. Good idea. All right. Thanks for go. coming, everyone. So, Brian is here from Polymode. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, we're here from XYZ, and let's go. All right. Um, so this was a custom project for Polymode, uh, and Brian's going to talk from the client perspective. Um, but um, they came to us with this question at the heart of this project, which was, how does a typeface express a view while remaining neutral? Um, and this was, uh, just to give a little, little background, uh, Polymode is a design studio. Uh, XYZ, Ben and I are a type, typeface design and lettering studio. Uh, so this was sort of a collaboration between us and um, Brian's studio, which is really a very typography forward practice. And so you guys, Brian, you came to us looking for this. You want to say anything more before we? Sure. Silas, so just so you know, there's, there's two partners at Polymode. There's me and there's Silas Monroe. I live on the East Coast of the United States and Silas is on the West Coast. Um, we are both two great friends we've known each other for 20 years but we kept realizing that we need something that was both expressive for poly mode but that could literally contain multitudes or could have some way of being expressive and neutral at the same time and from a an avenue of a typeface that can be a little challenging and there are only two individuals that we thought had the muster and the wherewithal to deal with us and that would be these two gentlemen here <laughs> thank you very much we do not pay Brian. Um, nope. No, we pay Brian them. Pays us. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. This is a very, uh, so when we're looking at the project, like it had a bunch of fundamental needs, like it needed to work well in running text, it needed to feel at home in an art book, it needed to have some sort of friction to be noticed, but not be annoying. And it needed to also work at display sizes, work at screen and be flexible in use. Um, so that kind of meant we had to make something that couldn't veer too far. Uh, from established norms, um, but had a flexibility to change tone. So when Jess, go. Oh, I was just saying, we, we wanted something that could really live in the incredibly broad range of work that Polymode does, which, um, I mean, you'll see some examples later on, but everything from their website to art books to uh, exhibition design. So where Jess and I always start is sort of research. Uh, first, we got uh, stuff from client. So Brian and Silas uh, sent us a whole sort of like Dropbox folder of inspiring images. Um, and so sort of like this was the range of stuff that they sent us. Um, so this is sort of, we, we encouraged this uh, as a kind of funny entry point to the project for them to give us some visual reference, um, things that they were excited about that captured the energy that they wanted. Uh, we wanted to take that and sort of put it into a blender and figure out what how that could that tone could be expressed in a typeface or even what kind of typeface would look appropriate next to any of these images. So that was sort of our is, yeah, and this is really important for us at Polymode because 
for us, we do something called poetic research where we really look at everything we're looking at, talking about reading, processing, whether it be work for a client, work personally, um, personal reading, um, things that we're dealing with both spiritually, psychologically, like mentally, physically, like we actually take all of it as a, a large organic sort of grouping. And so we do read a lot of books, we do read a lot of poetry, but we also write articles. And we like, we looked at sort of everything in our sphere at that moment. And these are sort of all the things that we threw at um, Ben and Jesse. And we're like, cool, let's see if you can find some some modes of connection between these things. But the best part was, was that they did and they understood why we were sending them these things. And it was really helpful. So from this, we got to here. So Jesse and I just sat and sort of brain dumped uh, everything that's sort of like our response to, to the images and sort of like, we also, they sent us a bunch of typefaces that they liked working with. So we kind of had a vibe of what they uh, are used to using. Um, We're pretty sure it want, we wanted to do a sans. We knew that much um, and a certain range of weights. But that was kind of about it. Um, so we did this and then from this brain dump, we sort of like went to our stacks and so sort of looked through specimen books, but also looked at uh, sort of our, our collection um, of photos of signs or uh, lettering around um, and sort of like took that and threw it all into a blender. Um, and so think about what, what kinds of letter forms capture some of that unusual energy that we were gleaning from the, the images and from our list of um, keywords. Yeah. So from that um, sort of in terms of process, what we came up with was this range, pun totally intended, uh, of possibilities um, that we presented because this was a, this was a project with a pretty open brief. Um, so we ended up with uh, eight different possibilities. Um, Which is crazy. <laughs> the crazy amount of exploration for project this scale. But I think we got really excited about uh, working with these guys and um, that it was an opportunity to explore some uh, some new ideas that maybe we'll have legs later on and that we might use for something else. So it was a fun entry point for that. There's always something to be said about the cutting room floor and what goes down for one client could also be gold for another. So yes, agreed. <laughs> yeah, and this is sort of like also our chance to kind of like take a temperature check of what they wanted. Um, so like what sort of things came out of this that they that Brian and, and Silas responded to? We talked about those for a while. I remember sitting in a meeting really talking about like, well, what about this G, the height of this A? What does that R mean? What can it feel like? We got very much into our emotions, into those vulnerable places saying like, I wanted to represent this or that, or this is going to be complicated or that, you know, this is too much. And yeah, we sat on this for a while. It was great though. Yeah. This I is, think we honed in on three basic directions, right? Yeah. So there was this direction, um, which was based on a uh, specimen this I think direction. we were calling that one melt or yeah, I'm the, trying to yeah that yeah, was this melt. one this was melt <laughs> so good words for them uh, uh this was based upon uh, a sign um, yeah a sign in brooklyn i think uh yeah uh, sign. uh i forget what we call this one swish i think yeah this was swish <laughs> um and then uh this third option which is based on lining gothic uh that was a sort of more historically based yeah um and so of these three options, um, we ended up going with sort of like taking this direction um, and sort of like looking back at specimens then um, to find like to find the weird stuff from the source material that we could use. So this because is a type thing. <laughs> go, go ahead, Jesse. So this is a typeface that was released in 1885 by McKellar, Smiths, and Jordan uh, by a designer named Charles Henry Beeler. Uh, and then sort of passed around from in different foundries, but ultimately ended up at um, American Type Founders. Um, so you'll see some specimens here from, from different foundries that had this style available. And by the time we saw it, like we loved how you can see like the R is like sort of smushed and not taking up a lot of space. Like the A, like in that lowercase A, like sort of like the there's like a mid like lower height and of course like especially for the two of us queer men modern bondage is always something you want to rely on for a type specimen when you're designing a typeface so we, we liked that this felt sort of um historical and a little bit um 
serious, but then had these moments of weird alienation or unexpected movements in there that really seem out of place in such a sort of bland sans serif. So that was kind of what, what pulled us into this and figuring out how that could um, carry the voice that we wanted. Yeah, and I think for us, like the thing that we really kind of picked up was that the lowercase g has this like kind of very in the y have these very like straight moments in them, which seems sort of unusual for this style. And it was that like kind of like that bit of friction that we were looking for, but still on something that kind of works at, at not quite neutral, but at a neutral level. You know, we we also, oh, go ahead, Brian. We're so great at this. Um, we also saw it too, is like when you look at this as it is right now, you can see like a display and a body copy, like pretty like discernibly, and you're not doing a lot to change what's really going on other than the thickness, but it still has its nuance, like at a, at a reading weight for like a book and then something that's better when it's a little bit thicker and more of like a display. And we could, we could see two very sort of very different styles, even within this, when we were looking at the, the notes that the two of you gave us. So we ended up here. This is the second sketch, second round of sketches. Um, like a quick, very direct rendering of the historical typeface. Yeah, <laughs> but there were things that uh, we didn't want to quite leave on the cutting room floor quite yet. So we tried to put in some of the other options into the lining Gothic to see how that would work. Um, and so there was uh, taking a bit of that idea of swish and putting it in. There was the idea of um, taking uh, the idea of melt and putting it in. Um, and then there was this idea, not from the cutting room floor, but what if everything got really straight and sort of more angular? So what if we like stiffened everything a little bit? Um, and then we sort of- a little more contemporary, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we'll put a pin on that because we'll come back to it. Um, and then we sort of had like some other ideas, uh, like what if we had a bunch of contextual alternates? Um, and then we sort of had this flyer, which was what if it was a variable font that like went really weird? Um, sort of thinking like what what is the really stripped down version of Lining Gothic with no weirdness at all, which would be that first line. The second line is Lining Gothic as it was historically. But then what if we take that and extrapolate into the wilderness of uh, these ideas get pushed way too far. And, and so we were all about it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, this is the moment where we should say the original scope of this project and the end scope of the project are two very different things. <laughs> they, they are. And we lovingly said, oh, cool. So it's not just like a family that has like, you know, four to eight faces. We're like, Hey, can you change the whole scope and make us a variable typeface? <laughs> well, we were excited to do that too, because we had um, we dabbled with variable fonts a little bit, but nothing like this kind of um, axis. So it was a, an interesting idea to explore for Ben and me. And it's also fun to have clients like Brian and Silas who like kind of push us uh, and they're just fun to work with. Like if this was a bank, we would never, well, probably make this typeface or like want to go over scope. Uh, but for Brian and Silas, we were more than happy to um, because, well, <laughs> Jesse is snickering. <laughs> we were happy to. Uh, so uh, now I'm off my, my mark. But uh, so this is like after that idea, we're like, okay, let's do this. Uh, and then um, this was the first variable font sketch. So you can see on the left, this idea of like from sort of the stayed to the crazy uh, and then that weight range. This typeface has a weight range. It's not a huge weight range, but it has a weight range going from regular to bold. Uh, so this was sort of the first initial drawings. Uh, and we hadn't done all the bolds for the zero and the thousand on the far right. So we just sent them this with some extrapolations and, and gave them this warning that uh, these are not done. Yeah, these are not done. That that's where it's recoiling on itself because of the extrapolation. You know. This is, this is where like, it's gonna get really messy, but like all throughout the process, we were sending things that Brian and Silas were dropping into working documents to see how they liked it and sort of um, if, if it worked for them or if it didn't work for them. That's kind of the ideal scenario for a type designer client relationship. I think when um, the client can start prototyping things right away and really give you actionable feedback based on real use and how it's working out for them. So that was, that was great to see happening. Of we course, can use their actual design documents as our proofs, essentially. Yeah. And of course, of course, like, like 
three days later on Instagram, we start seeing the dragons on the poly mode. Uh, <laughs> the we told, we're like, to we told you not to do this. <laughs> uh, but it was it was fun. Um, so I think the next sort of design exploration zone that we had uh, was what the italics would look like. And here we sort of like um, started with the weirdest one, the weirdest axis and sort of like played around and had um, this sort of range of things. Um, we were pretty sure the, the conservative end would have just essentially an, a, a corrected oblique italic, but we wanted to get a little wild for the, uh, what we call the opulent italic, the realist. <laughs> The most real. So sort of just exploring what might come um, in terms of the italic. So this is where the project ended up and we're gonna look at uh, some sort of um, differences, but these are the final fonts. And so we ended up with this range um, in terms of weight and then in terms of what uh, Polymode named the realness axis. I think Brian um, needs to read the names for Yeah, oh, Brian has to read do this. So for us, we were we were truly coming off of because what we're trying to do now, especially within poly modes, sort of like awareness is we're literally trying to say, what are the modes of understanding that have been sort of kept out of the canon? And so one of the biggest canons for queer individuals is sort of like the drag scene. And so we were using this idea that how can you also be sort of like very sort of like acting basic and like very sort of straight laced. And you can let it out a little bit when you go to work. Um, Silas and I always refer to each other as churl. And so like, that's the troll please moment where like, you're kind of getting into like a good sort of vibe. And then you have attitude and then you have the complete and audacious idea of opulence and like to own and control everything. And so we wanted it to be able to be in that range while also be able to bolding itself too. So it's like, you can see there's so many different options that we built out here. And we really wanted to be able to find many different nuances of style as we were designing this with the boys. At the end of the day, this seemed like the only real answer to the brief they'd given us uh, to fulfill the range of uses that they wanted to, to use the typeface for. So this is what the variable font looks like in motion, uh, going from um, acting basic to real, and then, um, sorry, from acting basic to uh, opulence, and then also sort of exploring the weight range. Um, so you can imagine like moving a slider around and getting something like this, which is just fun to watch. I, truly, this is where we're like, wow, we made this? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Carl. Yes, we do own everything. I'm glad that someone does understand some of these great references, <laughs> but like, this is just ways of sort of like reminding people like there's another history here underneath like what people know, right? And it doesn't have to be only for the queer community, but of course we're gonna trumpet it as much as we can. And so we try to, and that's where this realness quotient comes because sometimes I need to be buttoned up and sometimes I wanna flip my hair and be a little bit much, right? So it just depends on the day. So looking at the design itself, like the differences between acting basic and going to work, because uh, I think this is sort of the end of the family where a, a lot of sort of the tech setting happens. Um, and so the, the idea of like that very straight laced version, the very uh, angular version um, kind of came back into acting basic. Everything gets straighter, less round, uh, more horizontal, just more like kind of plain. Or or going to, yeah, kind of just like, like if you can imagine the boring version, that's acting basic. Um, where going to work, it becomes rounder, there are more cuts, um, the shoulders of the N get a little bit more angular, the flatness comes into the G, we, there's some flair in the A, um, it takes on a bit of personality. And we thought that might become more of a departure from Lining Gothic, but really at the end of the day, it's a pretty close revival of Lining Gothic. All the weirdness of that typeface carried through into digital form. So it's this sort of historical nugget in the middle of this uh, range that we created from nothing. Which still keeps it in line with we wanted to have some kind of workhorse typeface that could be something hyper, like, like, scientific, like very sort of methodical sort of textbook all the way to the other side, which was audacious and fantastic. 
So on the audacious, the differences between opulence and going to work, we did not draw diagrams because it is easy to see uh, how like um, we're changing proportions, we're changing um, how angular things are. Descenders like get really kind of exaggerated, um, like the the bottom tail of the G, I mean the T kind of like spills out a little bit. Um, this is where we did a bunch of stuff that was like over the top and sent it to them and they were and we were like, okay, they're gonna tell us to rein it in. But they were like, yeah. no, no, more, please, more. More. Yeah. more. A lot yeah, more. It was like, no, no, too boring. Keep on going. <laughs> oh, I love Carl's comment. You <laughs> we did spill the tea. Uh, <laughs> all right. over the table. Yeah, it's yeah. everywhere. Yeah. No, it, and and like it's like we we brought in like in terms of the image reference, there's a uh, there was a lot of sort of deco. Um, in the image reference that that Brian Silas sent us. So we sort of like leaned into the idea of Art Deco, but like Art Deco crossed with like kind of the like 90s in a weird way. Um, and just, yeah, they kept on pushing us to like make it weirder. But I can even say why that was happening because, you know, I, I think a lot of the reasons why we were sending you Art Deco typefaces is that you know, Silas is doing all of his research for um, W.E. Du Bois and um, Elaine Locke and the New Negro and looking very much at sort of like the Harlem Renaissance and when those books were coming out. And then he and I were also working on publishing an article about Dan Friedman and radical modernism and like the 80s. And so there's very much reason and rationale for why we're also in these spaces and sending them to you. But it's great that we also still let our intuition sort of take us to this thing that also has these references to the past but we're not getting stuck in nostalgia we're actually pushing it forward and making something that's hyper contemporary even with these understandings behind us i i, I loved working with polymood because our work is so often sort of devoid of content it's just letters that work functionally but um these guys brought so much more richness and context to what we're doing which really was an exciting aspect of, um, of the project and we had, we actually sort of miss our Zoom meetings. We had the best Zoom meetings. <laughs> the best part is just, you know, if, if any, everyone in the audience hasn't realized, I have a mouth on me and I really have no filter. And more of the meetings are, what can I say that makes Jesse blush and Ben go under the table? And that's pretty much like where a lot of our meetings went. And then Silas is also just laughing and, you know, hyperventilating at the same time. So it's always, it's always a great time. And it's no surprise they kept on being like, push opulence more and more and more. So. We would just have these meetings where we're like, no, can you make this weirder? And then we did. Um, so I just want to take a moment to talk about the italic because this is sort of like the big departure. And so as, as Jesse was saying, like we kind of knew acting basic and going to work would be um, pretty much just sort of a, a cleaned up uh, oblique. Um, but the opulence was sort of like, what are we going to do there? How do you take like obliquing this and cleaning it up would just kind of make it feel dull and like really take away a lot of the personality. So this is where we ended up with for italics. And you can see those first two really do feel like if you go back and forth, that the first two lines really do feel like you're optically cleaned up obliques. Um, but in the uh, opulence, we really like push things as far as we possibly could um, and this all like interpolates really well um, between these, um, which was sort of a challenge because the structure is unusual um, and really, really cut and sort of sharp in points. Um, so we're having a lot of fun with pushing variable fonts to sort of as far as we could to get clean interpolations between things. So I'm just going to run through a bunch of sort of like in use so you can see where um, things kind of landed. And these are sort of specimens that uh, we have. Shout out to Savannah Boo who made these wonderful images for us. Yes. This is a point like this is also a thing for signage. So the family has things like numbers and circles that um, can be used for reference or for uh, exhibitions which we did specifically ask for late yes. in the game. <laughs> and we did. Oh yeah, there are a bunch of symbols too, uh, shapes and things. Yes, there's shapes, arrows. I think it's like a 600 character glyph set 
not that glyph number actually really matters, but, um, but it does it, to you. It does to us. So that's sort of like our stuff, but um, this is where Brian will kind of drive. Um, but as we we said, we were uh, giving them betas uh, as we were working. Um, these are two projects, one by Brian, one by Silas. They were kind of using those early versions. Sure, so I can kind of talk about these. So Silas and I just wanted a reason to hop in to start using these, these typefaces. And so I've been working on a prayer book um, that encapsulates many different sort of like spiritualities. And I wanted to say like, how could I actually find different sort of prayers that are actually said and sung and spoken across the globe? And would it actually fit into this typeface? And so I got in and was working on my prayer book. And then Silas was working on what does it mean to have a black grid? And so these totally two very separate things in very, very different avenues also still have the heartstring that connect them. And can we still see if this typeface does sort of give us what we're both looking for and has a style that we both sort of reference and sort of feel like deep and intrinsically. And so this is where I was working on um, the layout of the prayer book and Silas was working on a poster for Black Grids. And this is a great project um, that is still up. Um, so we were asked by a storefront for architecture um, uh, by Amanda Williams was doing a new project of hers called What Black Is This You Say? Um, and so this is the social media of using different photographs and research that Amanda was doing. It's just finding different forms of black and blackness and seeing how that could also be very different and extrapolated over different times and spaces and moods and awarenesses. And so we were like, obviously this is a great typeface for this because all of these different things sort of fit into the typeface. And we knew that um, and if you go to the next slide, Ben, that it was going to be used on the actual side of storefront. And there were different sort of types of black, like ATM black. Um, and then there's sort of like, you know, Stevie's eyelids black and blackness is a color of black. And it also would have different paint colors that would also run down the side of the storefront. And so how could these different sort of sizes and awarenesses have a different feeling and a different vibe to them? And so we knew that Polymode Sands was perfect for this. And Amanda also really loved it, was really vibing with it. And so that's how we um, put it across the side of the building. If you're in Manhattan at some point, though, on the Lower East Side, this is still up, you can see it. So that was like the one of the first uses of the family and it was at the very opulent end. And then there was this use. Uh -huh. So we had just finished up uh, um, an exhibition for Fred Eversley, uh, who is a, uh, he builds these beautiful parabolic lenses of cast resin. I mean, one is something that, and he is very scientific, very aerodynamic and very sort of Southern California, West Coast, um, and he also is a um, gentleman of color. And we were like, we want this to also be able to slide to the other spectrum and sort of like uplift and like show, but it's very mathematical. His process is hyper scientific. And we wanted to be able to have and pull that same awareness and understanding into this publication of Fred's work. And so here you can see that we're using bold color, but we have footnotes running on the page. We have a lot of like very set tight, very fully justified, you know, hyper, hyper gridded sort of awareness, but it still has an effortlessness to it. It really, it spoke to Fred, it spoke to David Kordansky in the gallery, and it really just matched exactly what we were looking for. So we knew like we had something that was a winner if we can take it from both something for store for an architecture art and architecture, and then pull it this way to um, Fred Eversley's work. And the other thing that Polymo was working on at the time was a redo of their website. So like, this is where also kind of the variable comes in. Um, and so this is something that you guys were sending us betas of and Figma boards. And like, we were seeing how the typeface also looked like what the typeface did on screen and how it worked for um, your, your web design. The cats, everybody gets a spreadsheet, by the way. So many spreadsheets. Oh my God, yes. Hey, Shelly Fullwood, love you mean it. Um, so yeah, what we were trying to do is also, again, like we have to be able to build and use a typeface dynamically on a website that both can hold attitude, nuance, but also can be sort of like legible for different types of media, not just the desktop, but also on a, on a mobile phone, but also still has a sense of play and fun. Like we very much like, like to have fun though, you know, I am my classic Capricorn self and can be extremely uptight. Like we do have a lot of fun things that happen in the studio. And one of these are our ways of 
sending lots of animated GIFs that can show your emotions rather than you typing it out and saying something. So. So that is the project. Um, we're sort of at time. Uh, we made it. Did we go we over? We made it. No, no. Well, <laughs> technically, yes. We have two minutes for questions now. <laughs> and we, we can we can go over. It's it's fine. There's there's no other talk. This is the final talk of the day. Um, so we conclude the first day of One Fashion Week. That was fast. <laughs> but this is I I should have had my video on because the whole time I was like. <laughs> Such a good presentation, thank you. Um, no, this is brilliant. And um, we'll get to the questions in time, but I'm going to embarrass you first by telling you why I love this presentation so much um, and the project, obviously. So it's very well presented, but, but the typeface itself and the collaboration is really nice because it encapsulates just the joy of type design and what you can do with it and what typefaces are for, which is expression. So it's not just about you know, we saw a specimen, we drew it, now it's there and we make the variable font. No, no, it's 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 an investigation into expression and identity and, and power of typographic uh, representation as well. And, and all of it packed into a typeface. And then you see it sliding, you see it moving. And, and by the doing of it, uh, you show the potential of type, which is why it's really cool, you know? So I'm super, super happy and like brilliant design, like unbelievable. Uh, all the superlatives, thank you. <laughs> So uh, this is the kind of design I like because we push boundaries, you know, that's that's the fun part. And um, one of the things that I harp, out, harp about a lot, I don't know if that's the right way to saying it, but it, um, or complain about that, that we, we have too much crowded spaces in type design. And what you can see over here is that you started in a place that could have potentially very crowded. And instead of sitting next to 100 other typefaces, you pushed and you made the design space bigger. And then in the pushing of it, you've shown others just how much more possibilities are out there just by the act of pushing. So that's why like, I love this project. So thank you. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A. Um, is the typeface finished? Uh, so this is from Dominique. The typeface looks fantastic. I think the, like, the feedback in the chat is echoing that a lot. Great work all around, I agree. Is the typeface finished? Um, and then I have a follow-up question on that. On, on that. Uh, it's it's finished as much as anything is finished before it's been put out into the world. Um, it's uh, we we've been talking about some new exploration like pushing into lighter weights or what other um, ways we could expand the family, and we do intend to release it as a retail typeface um, before too long. And that was that was part of the original discussion with Polymed was that they they were excited about the possibility of this being something that other people could use as well. So um, yeah, we're sort of putting putting our finishing touches on it and hoping to get it out um, soon. That was my follow-up question. <laughs> like, will we get our hands on it? <laughs> Amazing. No, no, this is this is beautiful work. Thank you. Um, there's another question. Uh, uh, no, that was it. Um, so I, I have a question. Um, you know, there's always the, the lows and the highs. Um, and, and so I will ask for both. Like, when, in, in a typeface, there is always that Eureka moment. You know, like, when you suddenly feel like, yes, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. So, so maybe if someone could like share with us, when, when was that Eureka moment in this design? And then potentially what was the biggest challenge? Uh, this is not necessarily the low light, but, but the, 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 the hardest, hardest part, is it the technical? Is it the communication? Is it the express? Like where, uh, you know, if, if others were to follow or if you were to do this again, like where is that biggest stumbling block, block so that we know how to deal with it? So yeah, please. I don't know who wants to answer the question is open. <laughs> I mean, the highs for us, I think is that it was just, it was fun. We didn't come at this with it's drudgery or it's work mm -hmm. or, you know, we're buying something, do what we tell you, this is what we want. This is a tight brief. I mean, if, if anything, maybe the, the biggest challenge was you know, walking up to Jesse and Ben and being like, cool, can we like expand this scope like a lot? <laughs> like, and like really asking them to push more of their time and effort, you know, and remember like we made this over like the beginning of COVID when we're all still really freaking out and locked at home. And so yeah. really trying to figure out what makes us want to sort of delve into work into the creative space. And so maybe the biggest challenge was just asking, at least from our perspective, we really want to change this scope also while still trying to have a life and a business and do other things at another time. And I would say that was a very big ask from us to them. And I guess that might've been like 
one of the biggest challenges that's not creative of asking a team, like, can you actually expand this and work even harder for us? Now, sure, like some of the other things like cost, like can be can reconsidered and sort of talked about too. But I would say that was one of the biggest sort of lows. I mean, the biggest high is the fact that we laughed all the time. <laughs> like, we laughed a lot. Like there's a lot of joy. I mean, it's quite obvious. Laughter. It's quite obvious. Yeah. 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 But you know, also, I mean, one of the things that we, we should also like highlight as well is that it's quite unique that, uh, you know, a design studio goes and commissions a custom typeface to use in projects rather than a custom typeface for their own particular blending only. You know, like it's a little bit, it's a little bit different because it's it's almost like, uh, it's not like, hi, could you please make a suit for me? Like, no, come up with a system so we can clothe many different people. So it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different, but, but I, I'm, I, I find that quite interesting because typefaces that start off from a graphic design brief tend to feel a little bit different from typefaces that do not start from a graphic design. There, there, there's a realness in it that sometimes we miss in other projects. It's not that to say that if you only start from a type design brief, you don't get anything interesting. I'm not saying that, but there is quite a big difference when that collaboration starts with a real requirement in the real world. And, and, and you, see, you see that quite spectacularly here. So really well done. Thank you. And I don't know for Jesse and Ben, what, what uh, highlights were like. I don't and one, know. <laughs> one thing that was, it's, I think always a challenge to collaborate on a typeface, or at least that's something that every time that I've done that, worked with someone else on a typeface, it's like a new negotiation of figuring out how do we divide up the work and how do we make up, make sure our work is in sync. And we found that it actually worked quite well with this project because we had these different stations of personality and we were able to sort of pass back and forth. You know, Ben's working on the, the opulent while I'm working on the acting basic. And then we're, you know, swapping back and figuring out how to make those align with each other and interpolate well and, and create a, a good palette of styles for them. So that was kind of a, um, a challenge that became a, a pleasure of the project. I, I think for me, like the, the duality was the, the challenge and the joy was the brief being so open. Like it was this project where we were like, okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, like, you know, I, I teach and my, and my students like always want projects that are completely open ended. I'm like, no, you actually don't want that because you have nothing to push against. Um, and and we had things to push against in 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 the brief, but there wasn't a lot to start with, which is why I think like we explored more widely than we would have at the beginning and drew a bunch of stuff uh, to kind of figure out where to go. And so that was like lots of fun, but also, I mean, kind of scary at the start because there was this big ask like how how can we how can a typeface express and contain all these different sort of ideas um which is a kind of a hard thing to ask a set of shapes um and i don't know if we got to the one answer if there is one answer there is not um but i think like we we took a pretty good swing at an answer to that question Amazing. So we're getting a lot of questions, um, some of them in the chat, some of them in the Q&A. It's easier, you guys, if you post in the Q&A, please, because then it shows up as a number. Um, but uh, a quick question from Zachary Schwartz. Um, which level of realness uh, has been used the most so far? A good one. Um, true opulence has not been given to us yet as a project because until I am like literally bathed in glitter and diamonds, I'm not going to be dropping a full thousand italicized underline strike through, you know, like bold, like it's not there yet. And so until you give me that level of opulence, it will not be used. I just want to okay. talk that out there. <laughs> cool, cool. Okay, there's um, a question from Bob. Uh, I'm interested in the perspective of Brian and on the other side, Ben and Jesse, how you may approach the decision of commissioning a bespoke typeface design versus sorting something that exists. Is it an emotional, aesthetic, budgetary decision? What are some factors that you consider? Like, how do I answer that and not sound like an ego, like an egotist? Um, <laughs> we wanted, we just wanted something like, you know, Silas and I are nested in the book design world. Like we know our typography and our typography well, like we're mm -hmm. always looking for new things. We wanted mm -hmm. and like to use things that are very much like related to the project that we're doing. And this is something else that I had realized like 
in how we were talking of like, I think why the reason the typeface works is that you build such a solid foundation on research, understanding and awareness, listening, you know, really like deeply contemplating what these things are. And that once you pour that foundation, you know, any sort of structure can go off of it. And I think that's what Silas and I also wanted something literally just for us. And like, was there a budgetary decision? Yes, there was. I had to spend my well-earned money with Silas and <laughs> studio to have this made. But we also yes. knew that if you can use it on other projects and it's something that you actually like don't then have to buy something else, you are actually giving yourself sort of like a cost benefit analysis if you really want to get into the business of it. And you can say, well, you know, this is how I'm going to make it make its value worthwhile because I'm not going to be paying that to someone else. We can use it on the projects that we like. And then it does become very specific to if we know that this thing that's very tangible for a project that we're doing needs to have this feeling, we can then use that typeface and it makes sense, right? An intrinsic level is just, it's a straight line all the way through. Amazing. But also, of course, part of it is choosing the right partners for this, right? Because you need to know that the family you pick is one who is able to bring that expression to life and to fulfill yeah. and to be able to draw all of these different personalities in one and still make them compatible. Right. And we knew these two from Tyba Cooper. So we most certainly know the ability right. and the power. I know all the way back from undergrad, actually. Truly, because you started after, as we had mentioned earlier, like you were, you know, farewell by the time that I showed up. So nice. the RISD nice. mafia. I just like. Just, <laughs> I mean, whatever. <laughs> You're, you're like, still you you're out. still in you're in the room. Like it's not just the RISD <laughs> mafia. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when I was at Reading, there was talk of the Reading Mafia. Yeah, so I think like every big university has its own network, let's call it. It doesn't have to be called Mafia. We're not killing people here, no? I'm going with officials. Um, right. Um, then uh, a question from uh, Masato. Um, how do you see the use of variable font evolve in the near future in the typeface design community or in a client application? That's a really good question. Yeah, but I, I would like Brian to answer, to be honest, because yeah. we as a type design community have talked enough about variable and we sort of have a fixation on it. But it's a big question if the real life, there, in real life, there will be the uptake of like, you know. Uh, I mean, like, say, I, Masato, yeah. like I, to be honest, like you have to be able to know how to use a tool. It's like you can actually mm -hmm. make a very complex piece of machinery that has to be well-built, well-articulated, and then also can have the ability to expand the accordion and contract it and also make beautiful sound coming in and beautiful sounds coming out, you know, like, but then I, it's also a matter of who builds it and where you use it because some typefaces don't need to be a variable typeface. It needs to be a typeface that has a family of these styles and weights and go use it, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. I think you have to tangibly drop a good variable typeface at a certain time. At least that's how I see it as a designer. Now, I'm not on Ben and Jesse's side of the avenue there. Like mine is just, I'm not always gonna say for every single project that I will scope now, when I say, oh, you have to have a variable typeface, we'll have to make you one or find one that exists. No, I don't think that's true at all. I think it's just, you have to know what you have. And of course, for our website and our work, we knew it could be numerous different things. And since it has so many different styles, it still speaks of poly mode, but it can still whisper and it can still scream. And it still has the same sort of family and feeling, even if it's a brother and a sister or two sisters, or like, you know, there's just, there's a, a broader sort of understanding there. May I, may I continue your metaphor? Because I think it's a really good one. So you talk about the accordion, right? And great music coming in and coming out. What we need to do is train the musician because Correct. we need to play the accordion. That's, I think that's the difficulty because at the moment we have a community of brilliant type designers who are working with variable fonts and creating all sorts of amazing families as we see today. And in your case, you have the skill to be a trained musician to make music come out of this variable typeface, but it's not always the case. And we can see that now with open type features where still till today, 20 years, 25 years down the line, people are still not using open type features, right? Even style, you know, stylistic sets with else, which are quite, quite basic in comparison to complexity that we see with variable. So, uh, so potentially maybe, and I don't know, I'm jumping into the conversation here. The question is not to me, but uh, it could be that we need to focus on, on training musicians as well as uh, creating gorgeous pieces of music uh, instruments 
right? So we, we, need, we need that collaboration between the two. And like we see over here with the three of you. Well, I think that Does goes that make sense? Way as well, because, um, you know, I, this is not a, if we're using that instrument analogy, anal analogy, this is not an instrument that we probably would have made on our own anyway. I think that if, if mm -hmm. we had talked about this idea, I've been like, oh, that's silly. No one actually needs that kind of access in a font. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, we're just being self-indulgent and mm -hmm. trying to use variable fonts for the sake of variable fonts. But no, these, these guys came to us with a very um, a justification for doing that and made it actually seem like a worthwhile thing. So I, th I think that um, that kind of partnership allows us to see what it, what actually is useful and what um, what has value in, yeah. in using those kinds of features. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean, this is this is why I keep pointing to the collaboration. This is why I'm so happy with this presentation because it really shows the way. Um, ben, I think you want. To... I, I was going to say, like, I think to answer the question, really, like, the future is client application. Like, mm -hmm. when people see it being used, then they'll want to use mm -hmm. it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, the typefaces have to be there for people to mm -hmm. use, whether they're, mm -hmm. you know, a custom project like this where it's like very clear it's a client request. Mm -hmm. um, like, it made sense for the brief. Like the you know, like going through this presentation, we've, we've done this in kind of a couple different forms. Like, you know, it's obvious that the solution we came to was the obvious solution, but it wasn't clear at the start. Um, yeah. And like, but there couldn't really be another thing for, for the brief that, that we had. Um, and so, you know, and as Brian and, and Polymode and Silas use it, like it gets more exposure and people see the the utility and i think brian's absolutely right like not every typeface needs to be a variable font um absolutely. at all um mm -hmm. but there are there are things that make sense um and and like fun places that can move and i think mm -hmm. like you know that idea of motion mm -hmm. is really inherent in in the format and i think like it's this it's this moment where you know we're all sort of in the room right here kind of print people um but we also really like screen. Um, and, and honestly, variable fonts are, the, are this moment where you can have type that's not fixed to a page and it can move and, and it is of the medium, it's of the screen. Um, it, it isn't, it's flexible. Um, I mean, it's not new, we've had multiple master font. I mean, it's not a new technology, it's a new expression of it, um, but it's sort of in its moment is kind of now where people can actually use it in, a, in an interesting way. And you can see that, especially from the Polymo website, just like all the things that you can do. Um, so it's, it's fun. That's why you were all <laughs> entranced at the beginning of the, of, the, of the talk, like when it's just, you just wanna watch something undulate, like it's beauty yeah. and it's dance of itself, right? And it's dancing for its own benefit and its own brilliance and that's it. Like it's not for anything else other than it's like, it's radiance in existence, which is really beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think maybe this would be a good way to wrap the present wrap up for today, the presentation. So um thank you so much, Brian, Jesse, Ben, for this wonderful presentation and all the work that came into the project and, and what you've created together. Um like I was saying, this is this is everything that I look for, <laughs> both in a presentation for Font Fashion Week because we're pushing edges and you know. You are pushing edges, no? But like, you know, we're expanding the design space. We were showing what can be done with new technology. We're opening up channels of communication. This is this is all how how it should be. But also, um, just for the brilliant design. This is this is yeah. I, I had such a big smile on my face. The whole presentation is really really brilliant. So thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who um, attended today and is watching now or watching later. And this has been fantastic. I think you can see in the feedback. I will save the chat and share it with you guys as well so you can see what people have been typing. Um, it's It's been wonderful to have the audience join us and, and participate and ask all the questions. Uh, this concludes the first day of Font Fashion Week. We have 12 more presentations to go through. You will be seeing me every day doing something similar, but with different foundries. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again for everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to... You know, see when Polymod will come and become a typeface for the rest of the community to work with, and and good luck with that. And yeah, thank you, thank you again, and hope to see you soon in real life. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <laughs>